the woman called Marion Tobin. During the War of Independence, the 3rd Tipperary Brigade of the IRA were among the most famous units in the country. Individuals such as Dan Breen and Sean Tracy dominate the narrative, but Marion Tobin was key to the IRA's success in the area and paid a heavy price when her house was attacked by the Black and Tans. Her grandniece, Annette Condon, from Care, contributed a chapter to the Daughters of Dunishgig on Marion's life. And when we spoke, Annette began by explaining her granddad's early years. Born in June 1870, about six kilometres north of Care at Knockgraffan. The moat of Knockgraffan was beside their farm, which is considered an early inauguration site for the Kings of Munster. So she had a very rural, ordinary upbringing. To be honest, I did not realise my grandmother and Marion had come from such a large family. So that was uh, news to me. I had not realised the family was so large. Her parents, my great-grandparents, were Jack Crew and Bridget Keating. They were farmers from all accounts, you know, ordinary country people with no hint of any revolutionary background. Most of Marion's siblings would have emigrated to the U.S. In November 1902, she married James Tobin, who was from Tincurry, with my grandmother Annie as, as her witness, as her bridesmaid. Tincurry is a townland about six kilometres south of Cair, so as you're heading from Cair towards Cork. In the 1911 census, I found her listed along with beside her husband, James, and they had three children. At that time, May was age seven, John was age six, and Ava was age five. So James Tobin, from all accounts, was very involved. Um, the Bureau of Military History documents the forming of the Tin Curry Company on the roadside by James Tobin in 1917. And this was later to become the Care Battalion and later still the 6th Battalion of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. So the house Marion married into was referred to as the IRA Divisional Headquarters on the maps. And certainly from Marion's own words, his headstone records that he was a captain of the Irish Volunteers and in Marion's own words, president of Sinn Féin and he was in frequent correspondence with Archer Griffith after the 1916 Rising. What I thought was very interesting was this compared very radically to his brother John, who was a GP and a magistrate in England who and very well connected to the British establishment. So again, you have this dichotomy of two people in the same family choosing to follow different paths, which I find intriguing, um, how within one family, uh, you know, they can come to very different outcomes and very different opinions. Marion's life changed dramatically when she suffered two tragedies in close proximity. The first being the death of Annette's grandmother, as she explains now. So my grandmother, Annie, to whom she was very close, um, my grandmother lived in Cairns, so they would have lived relatively close to one another. She died in childbirth in October 1917. And then just eight months later, in June 1918, her husband died of cancer at only 51. And he left her with three children aged 14, 13 and 12. So she was well provided for, but it must have been a huge loss. She lost two very important people in her life within a relatively short time period. Yet seven months later, as a 49-year-old widow and mother, she was playing, as you said, her part in the, in the War of Independence, which I found remarkable. I think it was really she felt that she was continuing his legacy and that it was her duty to continue his work. The War of Independence began in South Tipperary when a shipment of explosives being taken to a local quarry at Solahed Beg was ambushed. Three days later, the men involved in that attack would turn up at Marion's door, beginning her involvement in the war. In the early hours of 22nd of January 1919, three young men arrived at her doorstep, cold, tired and on the run. Their names were Dan Tracy, Dan Breen and Sean Hogan. And they were at that moment the most wanted men in Ireland. They had just tramped across the Galtys, over the fields and along the railway line to care. And as Dan Breen said later, I will never forget her kindness to us that night. So in her own words, throughout the war, she provided shelter to the wanted men. She carried dispatches. She transported them. She treated the injured. She kept guns and ammunition. The family stories say that she hid gel ignite under the rose bushes, which were later used to destroy bridges in the area. Her garden and the grounds were used for meetings, to hide arms, conduct drill practices and mix explosives. 
I believe that they experimented there, with, particularly with mud bombs, which were used for the barrack attacks. So on several occasions, she would have saved their lives. She cleared away incriminating evidence. Her granddaughter told me that she would, if she was stopped by the British Army, she would distract them by throwing, offering them cigarettes. Um, I know from family stories, she risked her life driving Ernie O'Malley when there was a price in his head from Tim Curry down to Kilbehany, where he would then escape over the mountains to Aragland. So from all accounts, she was very cool under pressure. She was quite charming in her approach. She was quick with the cover story. And as I said, you know, knew how to distract the British soldiers when she was stopped. Um, so from all accounts, her house was in constant use by the IRA from 1919 until 1923. And she was de facto member of the organization. And the British Army would have raided her house on numerous occasions, but they never found any incriminating evidence. So she was well-versed in clearing away. Her great-grandson told me that her daughter, Ava, his grandmother, despite being only 12, um, that she played her part. And she was the passport holder for the local IRA brigade. And she was also given the job of taking care of tulip slips that would subsequently be planted on the rebels' graves once they were killed. And he also told me later, when she was an adult, that Ava, Marion's daughter, would place English stamps with the Queen's head upside down on her letters, even as a, an elderly lady as a symbolic gesture of defiance. So certainly her, her children seem to be, seem to be also versed um, in, in her whole revolutionary uh, background. Um, I met Ernie O'Malley's son at a lecture in care, and he told me that his father um, used to receive postcards from Marion's two daughters while he was imprisoned in the Curra camp. Alongside her logistical support for the IRA, Marion also stood for election in 1920, something that was a revolutionary act in itself. Women had only won the right to vote in 1918. She was the first female councillor in Tipperary in 1920 and one of just 43 across Ireland. It was really amazing because just two years earlier, women aged 30 and over had been given the right to vote. And so Marion's arrival on the scene as one, one of the first female councillors in Ireland was, was pretty remarkable um, in the context of that time. With Marion herself a prominent figure in the Republican movement and her house at Tincurry being used as a safe house for the IRA, it was somewhat inevitable that she would be targeted by the British authorities. This led to her house being attacked by the Black and Tans in what was a dramatic incident. Yes, it's a very interesting story. So over a period of 12 months, Tim Curry was raided as many times. So she was very well versed in the Black and Tans arriving at her house. And as I said previously, no incriminating evidence was ever found. But on May, the 21st, May 1921, in retaliation for the kidnap and execution of District Inspector Potter, which is in itself a terribly sad story. Uh, the Black and Tans arrived at her house and in reprisal for his death, 14 houses, including Tim Curry House, were destroyed. Um, according to the orders of Colonel Commandment Camerson. And what I found interesting was, as I said, Marion's brother-in-law was a GP and magistrate in Derbyshire and very well connected to the British establishment. And what I found amazing was the, the destruction of Tim Curry House, Marion's home, was actually discussed at Westminster. And I found this very interesting. I suppose last year, the year before, when I was doing, sorry, when I was doing the research, you know, all we heard from Westminster was about Brexit. And I thought, wow, you know, back then, imagine the, the destruction of a house in care was being, was being discussed in Westminster. So in the words of Dr. John Tobin, the military arrived and gave her an hour's notice to clear out her family, that the house was to be demolished. No furniture was to be removed, only sufficient clothing, no reasons given, nothing incriminating found, though the house had been searched and raided a dozen times or more night and day during the last 12 months or so. Before placing the bombs, the house and all its rooms were searched and every article of furniture was smashed with picks and hatchets. The beds and bedroom furniture, as well as all the old mahogany chests, were broken into matchwood. The new bathroom and bath and its basins were broken to bits. In fact, everything in the house, 
upstairs and down was broken with picks and hatchets so that nothing could possibly be saved or restored. Having thoroughly completed this wreckage, the bombs were placed in principal rooms and fired, and the dear old house and home blown to the four winds of heaven. Meanwhile, the widow and her little daughter, Ava Tobin, stood on the lawn as grim witnesses, carefully surrounded by the armed forces of the crown. And of course, my father's story then was that Mary had actually pleaded with the blackened hands to save the piano for her children and had pulled out the piano onto the lawn and played God Save Ireland. I don't know whether that's true or whether it's been added to by family accounts over the years, but it makes for a good story. Annette finished by talking about Marion's later life. So she served in the County Council until 1925. Uh, Tipperary County Council pledged allegiance to Dáil Éireann and the Council officially refused to aid the British military. Marion Tobin was really at the centre of it all. So the house was rebuilt later in 1921 and completed in 1932 as a single-storey building. Marion moved to another farm close to Tipperary Town, so she moved there and then later to Limerick. And the house was put up for, for auction in 1942. And then she, she died in 1955 and is buried in Ballyluby with, with her husband.